now, please welcome Chief Strategist and Chairman of the Board, Robert Cardillo. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, so great to be with you all. So great to be having this conversation and certainly wonderful to follow uh, one of my successors at, at NGA, Admiral Whitworth. And, a uh, great way to start our day and to continue this broader conversation amongst ourselves about how we can do better together. You know, how we can combine our efforts, um, solve new problems, create new opportunities uh, together. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to host the next conversation um, in our Planet Explore uh, conference. And this is with a good friend and colleague um, who has been serving our nation for uh, more than three decades. Um, uh, first raised his right hand into the United States Air Force in 1991, um, and most recently uh, became our second chief uh, space officer, uh, the head of our newest service, the United States Space Force. And so I hope you'll join me in, in, in giving a warm welcome to General uh, Chance Salzman. General Salzman. Welcome, Thank welcome. You. Thanks for joining. Um, I just have to reflect again. Um, I think it's the coolest name in government, Chief <laughs> Space Officer. Um, uh, we've got an international audience. We've got an audience with, with both government and industry and academia. Um, because the Space Force is our newest service, maybe you could open with a little introduction. Where, where is the, our newest service in the movie, Chance? Well, we're out of our terrible twos. Okay. Uh, into the toddler phase. Uh, we're three years and about four and a half months old now. Okay. Uh, and I think the way I would describe the effort is, of course, when you're a new service, it stands to reason that there's a lot of establishment functions that have, we've got to bring people into the service. I literally had to be discharged from the Air Force and re-swear in in the Space Force. So there's a whole process to make sure we get the talent in, hiring all the civilians, uh, uniforms and songs, and you got to take care of all those things. That's just part of being a military service. But now we've got to start really doing the hard, uh, answering the hard questions, the foundational questions. What is our purpose? What value do we add to the Joint Force? Uh, what is our model for how we acquire things, how we train people, how we educate guardians? That's the work that I'm really focused on here in the next uh, next few years. Uh, sounds very exciting. Um, I'm sure there's some days when you use other words <laughs> yeah. uh, for uh, being, what, 40 months old. All right. Um, but I suspect there's a little bit of opportunity in being new, right? Get to, to maybe challenge old ways of doing business or, or reforming relationships. You've got a room uh, full of partners here many from industry that either are or are seeking to serve your needs. Um, how have you and the team thought about perhaps rethinking those relationships and better leveraging what the commercial industry can provide to your mission? It's an important question. Um, you'll hear me talk about the, the criticality of having uh, mutually beneficial partnerships and the commercial industry, uh, the commercial base is, is, is is one of the most important relationships that we have to make sure we get right. And so, again, back to asking some of these foundational questions. What exactly is commercial augmentation? It can kind of roll off the tongue, but are we talking about traditional acquisition relationship where the commercial sector builds a satellite and we buy it and we fly it? Uh, are we talking about commercial services, more like the way launch is working as a, a launch service provider? Are we talking about data? Are we talking about outsourcing functions like collision avoidance in space? And that's done commercially and we, we get the results of that. And so I think there's one part is clearly identifying the various ways that commercial capabilities can augment. And then doing the, the real hardcore analysis that, that says, what is an inherently military function for the Space Force? What's a governmental function? And what can we leverage partners to perform for us? Um, you would think, well, that's easy, but mm -hmm. you really start asking the questions and, and, it's, and it really is more complicated than that. And so exploring that space with partners uh, to inform that so we can make the right kinds of decisions to get the right kinds of services, data, augmentation, that's kind of what we're focused on at this point. Um, 
you know, another one of the challenges and, you know, having spent nearly four decades myself on the other side is, is the reality and necessity of classification. Um, you're responsible to execute very sensitive missions on behalf of the nation and our allies. Um, th there's a necessity a around that to, to be careful about what you, you can share, et cetera. We're at the unclassified level. Um, much of the industry exists at the unclassified level. Academic institutions do their research in the open. One of the challenges I've had to think through is, in, and I'll just use my experience, was we would do the classified work as far as we could take it, and then we would peek over the other side and go, hey, I wonder what I can get from that unclassified source. And I think we now know that's probably backwards uh, if we don't lay that in uh, at the front end. I guess a long way to ask you, how do you think about how we bring those capabilities together? And again, respecting the need for the classification while welcoming in unclassified sources. Um, I'm preaching the choir here. I recognize that. Uh, and, you know, guys like Robert and I, every time we're asked a question, go through this mental model, like, what can I say? What can I not say? You know, and, and it just becomes habit. Um, so first, we absolutely have to balance the two worlds. Uh, and I believe complementary is the right way to think about it. I think it's hard to really be good in any area if you don't apply the other area. And so, for instance, we've used open source intelligence to complement other forms of intelligence decades, years, centuries, perhaps. Um, I don't see any reason why space-based information would be any different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, that's both an opportunity and, and uh, a challenge to figure out exactly where the line is. But when I say that I need to uh, fully integrate allies and partners, and that one of the barriers to that integration is security, then I'm looking immediately for ways where I can include them in real mission and have information that I can share with them. Mm -hmm. So unclassified information certainly helps. We do a lot of work with civil authorities, whether it's fighting forest fires or supporting hurricane relief and um, flooding. Uh, Space-based sensing helps in those areas, but it's hard to give classified information to local law enforcement. So again, having all of that information at our disposal ultimately builds situational awareness where we can make operational decisions that are relevant and then we can share it appropriately. Uh, for me, the, the vast amount of information that is now available at the unclassified level builds context around the things that are classified mm -hmm. and actually helps us better interpret the meaning of that classified information. Right. So I think it truly is complementary. Right. Yeah, I could, couldn't agree with you more because, you know, context, frame of reference to be able to take that exquisite insight which, by the way, may or may not be classified. It just could be sensitive because of how it was acquired or who, who, who shared it is, I think, what leads us to that advanced understanding. Um, let's move to talk a little bit about technology. You mentioned earlier the procurement process and the, and the, you know, the machine, if you will, of, of, of how the government works. And, and by the way, there's good reasons for why that machine exists, uh, to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and be careful about... Uh, lanes in the road and, and, and policies and, and legal responsibilities. And we also know, and the secretary has recently reaffirmed that we have a pacing threat um, as a department um, and, and our adversaries are moving sometimes uh, more quickly uh, than our machine has in the past. Uh, this room is filled with people that, that are thinking constantly about upgrading their technology uh, solutions and approaches in ways that advance their competitiveness, because that's how the market works. Um, how can we, I guess, bring those worlds together uh, in a way that, again, respects the lanes and protects privacy, civil liberties, all the things that are also important to us, and yet yeah, picks up the pace a bit? Well, don't respect the lanes too much because that demand signal helps. Okay. <laughs> I, I think uh, with industry pushing the envelope, it keeps opening our eyes up to other possibilities. And then it's our job in the government to say, how do we take advantage of that? So I, I hope you don't self-filter. I hope the industry doesn't self-filter because they know we're going to be slower mm. uh, than maybe we, anybody wants to be because we are trying to go as fast as we can. Um, there's no question that we are rethinking all of the models associated with acquisition and procurement. Uh, Frank Calvelli has done a great job of kind of enumerating that. that we're, we're a little bit in a convergence of 
of uh, new ideas, new capabilities with, with um, small satellite manufacturing at scale. Uh, launch to, to orbit price per pound is going down so much uh, that it opens up other opportunities. Um, software development on timelines that, that weren't the same as when I was growing up in the business. Uh, all of those are opportunities for us to see tech refresh, refresh on different timelines, um, how long a satellite needs to last on orbit. Uh, again, when I was learning to fly satellites, things like mean mission duration were kind of the coin of the realm. How long will this satellite last? Because the expense of putting it on orbit, the process to engineer it and test it and do all the mission assurance and get it on orbit was so onerous, you needed that thing to last decades. Um, we're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so how do we take advantage of that? And I think, like I said, Frank Cavelli's tenants on small satellites and using existing technology to reduce non-recurring engineering and uh, short fixed price con contracts, those are... Um, I think good examples of how we can take better advantage uh, of the tech agility that we're seeing in the industry. Um, here's the one caution. Uh, again, as the models shift, there are some watch words that we have to become uh, attuned to and kind of get them out of the system. Things like vendor lock, mm. things like proprietary information, uh, data rights. These are things that scare program managers, you know, as you would imagine. So I, I think those are old phrases, old words that we need to be less concerned about. But now we have to work the new vocabulary with tech agility, refresh rates, uh, and, and redefine how we see the relationship with industry to get it right. I just want to follow up on that because, you know, you said at the top of your answer there, don't always mind the lane, right? Uh, maybe be a little edgy, uh, uh, a little challenging with respect to s some of those. Um, but again, to your point that we, we hear often that, that you know, the, the government clearly requires resilience and reliability and assuredness, and, and those are important attributes of, of any service. Um, does industry need to do more to, to to make sure that you can count on the industry to do your important mission? Is, is there, are we still in a gray area of, uh, you know, of transition perhaps uh, before we become that trusted partner? Yeah, I mean, this goes both ways. Um, probably industry can do more. Certainly the government can do more. Uh, it's about enhancing the relationship um, at scale and for speed. That, and the things we've talked about, uh, new business models, uh, new, how do you sustain a system? Do you keep just updating software and expect the hardware to stay the same, or do you replace the hardware? These are just new models. Mm -hmm. um, if you're waiting for us to write the perfect RFP uh, that perfectly defines our requirements, that if you meet them, we will be perfectly satisfied with, one, uh, we probably won't get that right. <laughs> two, if we did, it would be immediately perishable and dynamic and we would want to change it. And now you get into requirements creep and all those things that we know that stretch programs out. So it's just, it's just about reshaping and working together. Don't make me write the perfect RFP. Help me innovate. Show me the, the art of the possible. And then how do we go in short, achievable, discrete mm -hmm. uh, building block approach to make sure that our technology is as advanced as it possibly can be? Yeah find a way to test the proposition, learn from that test, exactly. apply those lessons, keep it rapid. iterating forward. Yep. Right. A rapid feedback loop. Um, I'd be remiss if we didn't spend a little bit of time on you know, that pacing threat. Um, uh, China has had in many ways an, uh, a remarkable rise in its capabilities over the years. Um, uh, I would suspect, uh, given the documentation we've seen out of the Pentagon, that that's first and foremost in your mind. Uh, anything that, that, that this room could, you could either tell this room or you could ask of this room to help us uh, not just keep up with that pacing threat, but to, to keep ahead of that threat. Uh, I think there's no question that having a robust and resilient industrial base uh, is critical to us going fast enough, putting the military capabilities in place that first and foremost deter any adversary from taking an action that we can't live with. Uh, and so um, I would be remiss if I didn't say on our side of this that the government needs to help the industry by making, making sure that there is a stable, 
uh, line of resources and funding. Uh, things like continuing resolutions have a way of, of breaking down that. And I, we recognize that if you can't count on funding year to year to year, it makes planning for technologies that do take a few years to put in place much more unstable, much more um, risky uh, from a course. We, we understand that. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, we go over to the Hill frequently to explain how stability of resourcing is one of the most important things to making sure, one, that we have an industrial base that we can count on to develop the kinds of capabilities at speed and scale to deter this threat from, from, uh, from doing what it wants to do. So those, those are, you know, this is on both sides of us. Uh, and then again, second, I think it's about innovation. It's about looking at our processes and procedures and saying, Hey, the things that worked in the 90s and the 2000s, even, even 10 years ago, uh, if we think that just small enhancements to those processes and products will, will work in this new era with the new challenges we face, I think we're kidding ourselves. It might be more comfortable to yeah. think that way, but I think there has to be something more disruptive. And this is a two-way street that we've got we've to gotta break down. Um, I know you've spent a lot of time, new service, new uh, culture that you're creating, new processes. Again, learning from the best practices of the past, but also challenging some of those old habits. Um, as you think about your guardians and as you think about developing that, that critical, critical workforce, how are you dealing with it? So here's my experience. Uh, unfortunately, I think the way we've created incentive systems for our teammates sometimes become disincentives, meaning we teach our teammates to avoid mistakes, which is a good thing, and, and to stay way inside the lines in order to not get uh, in trouble, you know, or have the inspector general show up on your doorstep. Right. Well, that's, again, there's goodness to that, but it leads to a, a caution, right? A, a risk aversion. Uh, again, new service, how are you trying to deal with that to maybe give them a little bit more freedom of movement? again, within the bounds, uh, that leads to the innovation you just spoke about. It's a really, because that's a cultural shift, it's probably one of the toughest things to really manage. And I mean that in the positive sense that cultures, once they're ingrained, are very powerful structures. Um, if they're the wrong culture or they emerge from an old culture, then you have to change the culture. That becomes a very tough proposition. And that's what you're talking about is, is how do we think about risk? And how do we empower decision making with a new concept for how to think about risk? Uh, we're working hard on that. Is the only thing I can say is we're working hard on that. So in military terms, we talk about mission command. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've, I've had to talk about with senior leaders of the military because it's, we say it all the time, mission command. And I think what we hear sometimes is just delegate to lower levels. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, mission command is far more complicated than that. It requires a very tight feedback loop where you give clear guidance and intent. You, you train so that the people you're, you're sending orders down to are competent in performing the task. They have the resources. It's, it's actually much more difficult than just simple delegation. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that once you get it right, truly empowers the lower echelons that are closer to the problems that we're trying to solve to be innovative about how they might want to do it. Right. Give them a left and right margin, tell them your intent, tell them where you see the vision, and then be really good with allowing them to do the work, even when that means making some mistakes. Mm -hmm. And what I tell the, the senior leaders in the Space Force is the real measure of merit is how you respond to the mistakes. Mm -hmm. If you clamp down hard, they learn that risk aversion lesson in spades. Uh, if you think of it as a learning process and failing quickly is value added to the system, uh, it, it really gives, it even broadens their, their uh, ability to think more broadly than before. And so that's mission command, pushing down competencies, allowing innovation to occur at the lower levels, and then responding to failures, mistakes, accidents as learning opportunities to accelerate the learning process. I used to call it uh, fantastic failures. Right? <laughs> exactly. You know, if you're, if you're going to do it, do it it's spectacularly, big. right? You'll learn. You'll yeah. learn better. Yeah. Um, but the, to your point, everyone then watches the behavior, right? Did you mean what you said? Will you really cover me? You know, I had good intent, right? And, right. and it didn't work out. Um, you've said a couple of times w where you need the room, right? A little bit on the edge of the road, challenging you, challenging some pre uh, procedures. You also reminded us don't wait for you to come up with the perfect question uh, or RFP request for proposal. Um, what would you leave with the room as a 
maybe a challenging opportunity or two that, that would help you, say, in the fourth year of the Space Force, in the fifth year, if not the tenth year? What I find internal to the Space Force, which I can only presume lives on the outside of the Space Force as it interacts with the government, is that we, we have assumptions that we've quit evaluating. We've quit testing certain assumptions because they've become fact. Whether it's in acquisition processes, whether it's in how, you know, CRs, that's just fact. No, let's, let's, let's challenge that assumption. There are ways that we can do this without continuing resolutions. Um, the federal acquisition regulation is the federal acquisition regulation. But there's actually a lot of authorities in there that are kind of uh, hidden sometimes in our standing procedures for how we want to do business. Test the assumptions. Challenge the assumptions. Ask us the what-if questions. Um, I, I, I challenge the team to answer challenges with yes, if answers, not no, because answers. Mm. Uh, and I think that just a simple mindset shift allows them to say, well, yeah, sure, we could do that. But the following things would have to be true. And what they're thinking is there's no way the boss will make those things true. And it turns out no problem. Like, I'm, you know, they say, well, this is in law and there's no way to change the law. Actually, there's easy ways to change the law if you get support. Mm -hmm. uh, and I get congressmen and, and senators and uh, of all ilk that say, hey, what can we do inside the law to right. help you do your job better? And so these, these assumptions that, well, it's in the law, so there's nothing we can do about it. That's a false assumption. And so outside and in, test those assumptions and break down um, the policy and procedures that are getting in our way. Um. I'm, I'm a biased observer given our long history of, uh, of working together and, um, and supporting each other's mission. Uh, but I'll say here, uh, the nation is well served by having you in this position. Um, I can't think of a, a better leader for this time, uh, for this challenge. And uh, I would offer, uh, you've, you've done a great service to this room as well. And I then commend our audience here in the room and online to step up to the challenges you've given us here today. I, I think they're great opportunities for us all. Please join me in thanking General Salzman for his time and for his service. Sure.